This is the Lean Construction Blogs Podcast, a podcast dedicated to stories, case studies, and lessons learned of applying lean construction from around the world. Join Dick Beyer as he interviews industry leaders, lean construction practitioners, and subject matter experts to help you improve the build environment in general and your design and construction projects in particular, advance your lean journey, and bring your continuous improvement efforts to the next level. Let's get started. Welcome, everybody, to uh, the podcast. This is the Lean Construction blog.com podcast with Dick Beyer, and that's me. Um, today, we are joined by a really um, interesting and um, special guest and a good friend uh, who has spent a lot of time thinking about things that we chat about in our industry a lot, and that includes not only reliability, but the um, the increase in productivity using important kind of tools that they can really help us on construction projects because uh, as people who've listened to this broadcast before know my my feeling is that there's a time it takes to build a building and a cost it should cost to build the building and we never hit those exactly so what we're trying to do is figure out a better way to get closer to what that should be and eliminate as much of the uh, the non-value added work as we go along so without further ado let me introduce Gary Fisher Gary is the president, chairman, commissar, czar, head Puba of the Project Production Institute, which was a brainchild of Todd Zabel and some other folks, um, to take what we have known in our community as the last planner system, reliability in planning to the next level in terms of really cranking up the productivity. Um, but Gary's got a backstory and he's a good guy, so let's uh, let's introduce Gary. Hi, Gary. Good morning. Thanks for the opportunity to share my story. Um, I uh, I love your story, and I'm I'm loving. That. I think this is an extension of uh, the most watched podcast we've had, which is with Todd. So this is a a really timely follow up to that. And as I as we were talking before, there's an awful lot of chatter on LinkedIn, which is my only social media these days. <laughs> Mm -hmm. You know, I gave up Facebook because my grandparents and my grandchildren are really better than everybody else's, and I don't want to have that argument, um, plus <laughs> the political mess that that gets into. So uh, we follow a lot on LinkedIn, and there's a lot of chatter about CPM and scheduling and all the rest of that. So let's uh, let's spend an hour or so um, talking about what you guys are doing and what you know and what you've learned, And uh, but let's start with where you come from. Let's give everybody a little context. All right. Well, I um, I hail originally from Colorado. I uh, got my bachelor's in civil engineering from Colorado State University. Seriously, uh, I'm a yeah. I'm a Denver boy myself. We go back five generations in Denver. And you're a CU grad, right? I went to CU Law School. My mother went to CU. My grand my father went to CU Law School. Yeah. My cousin, much to the chagrin of the family, went to CSU. Uh, or my niece, uh, my <laughs> niece, my, my cousins all went to CU. <laughs> well, CSU fit me a little bit better. I grew up in, in Western Colorado out on a farm. And uh, so um, had that kind of lifestyle growing up. It was great for a kid uh, fishing and hunting and all kinds of really hard work like bucking bales and uh, uh, picking rocks. Wow. <laughs> My father was a real estate developer. And so I got to see the uh, law, a lot of time on the wrong end of a shovel. Um, <laughs> being a laborer for him, uh, doing carpentry work and all those kind of things. And uh, I thought to myself, you know, I want to be the guy not down in the ditch. I want to be the guy standing up there watching everybody else down in the ditch. So that uh, motivated me to, to get some grades and get to college and work my way through college. And um, yeah, I certainly know that, that story. Um, but how could we, we'd be remiss if we didn't touch on Palisade Beaches. Uh, while you're talking about Western Colorado, so oh yeah, they're they're some of the best. Um, in fact, uh, as a teenager, um, to help pay my way through college, my father helped me buy a piece of uh, property, and it was about ten acres, and it was all fruit trees. It was uh, pears wow. and apples, and I was a farmer for four years, and then uh, towards the end of my high school years, I subdivided that into four parcels, uh, put in a water system and roads. 
and then sold it off. And that's what primarily paid for my college education. Wow, that's fantastic. Well, back in the day, uh, when I was a kid, CSU was known as Colorado Agriculture and Mining. It was uh, yep. Colorado A&M and a big focus on agriculture. They still have, I think, the number one veterinary school in the history of the world there. Yeah. yeah. I mean, all kinds of really interesting things. So, all right. Well, that's fantastic. All right. So, um, so you looked at the guys in the, you were a guy in the, in the trench. I was a guy in the trenches and I know I didn't want to do that the rest of my life. So uh, um, after, after graduating from uh, college, I was fortunate enough to uh, hire on with Chevron. Uh, in fact, I had a summer job with Chevron um, uh, between my junior and senior year. And I worked on the Rocky Mountain region and he found out, man, this is really interesting stuff. Um, um, got to chase around the oil fields and uh, try to find contractors. They'd send me, the, we, we have Joe Blow working on some tanks out there in, uh, in Vernal, go find him and see if he's doing anything. So I'd do my best, drive around the oil field with a map, you know, I'm just oh, yeah. a college kid and, and I couldn't find Joe Blow anywhere. So um, it was it was an interesting experience. But then um, after I graduated, Chevron said, hey, uh, you want to come to work for us full time? And I said, yeah, what you got? And they said they made me an offer on the West Coast. Um, and I said, uh, growing up, there are kind of three things I was never going to do. I was never going to wear a suit and tie uh, to work. I was never going to live in a city and I was uh, never going to live, you know, um, uh, work for a big corporation. So oh, I started uh, I started my <laughs> career in downtown San Francisco wearing a suit and tie living in Sausalito. <laughs> so never well, say never. best laid plans, you know. Never say never. Yeah. Um, and I got and I got uh, I started in what was called the engineering department at the time. They have a, a group that did uh, engineering designs. Chevron actually did perform engineering back in those days. Um, spent a little bit of time there and then got myself uh, onto a project. And at that time, oil prices were, you know, kind of in the stratosphere like they are right now. And uh, Chevron had major holdings of oil shale in Western Colorado. And having grown up near there, I thought, oh, man, that'd be really cool to be able to get on a big oil shale project and get get back to Western Colorado. So I got myself on the oil shale project. Wow. And it, they uh, even created a town, Parachute, Colorado, for the oil shale development. That's right. Absolutely. And, uh, I don't know if you ever knew a guy, a lawyer named Frank Cooley, but he was a friend of my dad's from law school. He was the only lawyer in Meeker, Colorado, mm. and he had been pumping up oil shale since the 50s. So, yeah, we share a lot of common common background there, my friend. Yeah. So you got yourself on uh, an oil shale project. Okay. And then uh, uh, Chevron uh, had a, the, uh, its own technology for uh, retorting shale. Um, but it needed a demonstration. So Chevron's got a refinery up in Salt Lake City. And uh, so this big demonstration plant was built right next to Salt Lake. I got a job as a construction engineer. That was my wow. very first real hands-on project work. So I worked there as a construction engineer helping build that plant. It was fairly good sized. It was about the size of the Salt Lake refinery. It was a pretty big, pretty, pretty big project at the time. Um, and then I stayed on through the operational phase of it. Um, we tried to make it work. And then I got the job to close it all down. I had to work with the EPA to do the environmental closure, tear everything down, rip out everything out, close it up and uh, find homes for all the people that worked there. So that was like an entire asset life cycle in four years. It was really cool. Really yeah. cool experience. Uh, one that was really formidable for me. And I really got hooked on projects. So. After that, I just I just kept working on projects and I worked, uh, uh, got to work in our refining organization then back in uh, here in the Bay Area. And then I got to have a little job in Hawaii, which was quite nice. Um, and then I continued to work on successively increasing responsibility and in, in roles. So I then went to Houston, worked uh, for Chevron Chemical Company at that time, uh, built a linear low density polyethylene plant in Cedar Bayou and a high density polyethylene plant over in Orange. And then uh, about that time, uh, California passed the clean air um, uh, requirements that changed uh, the requirements for the reformulation of fuels uh, to reduce pollution. And so that required some really big investments in the refineries on the West Coast. And I got, I got lucky, I got uh, uh, tapped as a project manager of a, of a world scale alkal called alkylation plant here in Richmond, California. 
Wow. And I got to, man, that was a, that was a, a really an interesting job working. Uh, we had. You found yourself in Richmond, California. Yeah, it was in Richmond. And we the had. Line, right? Yeah, we had a really interesting challenge because we had a mandated date that new fuel had to be produced or there were major fines if you didn't produce it. Okay. And, uh, you can imagine the permitting process in California uh, pushed everything this way and we had a fixed date there. So we were getting this compressed, compressed, compressed. Right. Um, so we uh, developed a strategy. Uh, one of the first ones that uh, Chevron ever used to um, basically build the units in Louisiana. And we <laughs> shipped it through the Panama Canal, brought them into Richmond, transported them to site, connected everything up. Um, it wasn't so really early hands-on work with pre-assembly, prefabrication offsite wasn't done to try to reduce our costs. We just wanted to remain cost neutral because it's very expensive to do that. But it really gave us a huge advantage on schedule because we were able to effectively start the construction without having a building permit. And so we were able to make it work. We, we finished on time and on budget, made, uh, made the products that were necessary to uh, continue to do business in California. That was a lot of fun. Uh, that was your, Go ahead. Yeah, that was your that was your first experience with a uh, with a, with a regulatory constraint. I take it. Oh yeah, well right? of, that, of that magnitude. Yeah, that you know every place has you know, you know regulations to go through, but working in Texas and Louisiana was a lot easier than working in California. That's oh yeah, well r- right about that time, the early '90s, I was uh, teaching environmental law at the University of San Diego yeah. and was involved in a brownfields firm. So. There were opportunities in those uh, in those environmental regulations, but it was also a huge a huge push um, to try to get our arms around an almost intractable problem that we still haven't really got our arms around yeah, completely. It, it was really interesting how one one body of regulators, you know, wanted this done to make clean fuel. Another body, multiple bodies of regulators were doing everything they could to block it and prevent it. And it's right. it's like the environmental community is, does not speak with one voice. Let's just put it that way. Yeah. Um, it's it really interesting to watch. Um, it's for sure. I actually did a mediation between two disparate environmental groups in San Diego who were, right. there were the Bugs and Bunny people and then there were the, the Metro people and they had very different ideas about yeah. um, what development should look like. Oont, oont, oont. How to do it, all those kinds of things. Well, so it's, how it's, did you... So yeah. I mean, you were talking about you brought it in on schedule and on budget, and those are those are buzzwords, kind of in the in our you know in the construction community for sure, um, and they mean different things to different people. So from my perspective, that schedule is uh, is is really for bus companies and <laughs> and people who have you know a very unitary one line delivery where they have to deliver one thing at a time. But in construction, we deliver multiple things all at the same time and so it, it adds complexity to complication and so i'm sure that uh, especially building the units in louisiana and shipping them out was um was a complication that ended up being complex as well no doubt about it and as as i can look in hindsight with the knowledge i have now i can see we did we did a lot of things right without knowing we were doing it so we didn't use uh, CPM to to estimate when we would be done. We were told when we had to be done. I mean, it was it was a hard fast date. So we spent all our time focused on what I would call now designing the production system or being very deliberate about how the work would be done so that we could enable ourselves to make that date. And so we were very involved, as, even as a project manager. I remember helping we built plastic models back in those days. Okay. Yeah. Which I really miss. I think they added a lot of value because you could see things. We built little plastic models where we were pulling in the, the modules and pulling in the equipment and developing the sequence that the work needed to be done in to be able right. to fit things in because you could, you could easily block yourself in. So you had to work from the backside of the plant to the front uh, or those, otherwise we couldn't get things in all, all kinds of things like that, that, uh, our, our team was very hands-on, very involved in how the work was going to be done with the contractors we hired. Uh, it was a very, um, I would say, a collaborative uh, environment. Uh, we set up between the engineering company, the construction company, and the owner, our, ourselves, the Chevron. You couldn't tell who was who. Um, 
and, and in fact, we had a little indoctrination session. We gave everybody that came onto the project, and I delivered many of those. And at the end of those, we'd say, if you don't want to work on a project like this, because we talked about the culture we wanted, we talked about the attitudes, the different way we, we needed we need to never open a contract. Okay. We wanted a, a project where the contract didn't matter. That we were all focused on getting the work done the right way. Uh, and we'd ask people, if you don't want to work on a project like this, please let us know. We'll find you another job. And it was interesting. I'd say 10, 15 percent people said, no, I don't want to work on a project like that. Yeah, and there were probably another 10 or 15 percent who should have held up their hand. Yes, there were. <laughs> and we, we actually found those later and they usually found another job. Uh, we, <laughs> yeah. made it, we made them available to industry. But the, but the key, the key you know, of course, you got to have people aligned on doing whatever you're going to do. I had no pushback on that at all. But the real key, and I can see it now, is that we were we were deliberately designing our production system without knowing that's what it was called and that's what we were doing. And right. I can see that a lot of things we did right in hindsight, uh, I wished I would have known more about. I wished I would have known Todd back then and <laughs> got myself educated in production management. We would have even done better. I think we could have, we could have uh, shaved even more time off of that project and we could have reduced costs even more. Yeah, which, but, what's funny, I think, what's actually really lucid about what you're saying is that the, we stumble onto solutions for things through necessity yeah. Um, and we have focused on so many different kind of irrelevant things. Like we have been trying to sell the risk of scheduled delivery for years and we pay a lot of money for people to accept it. And then yeah. the risk always falls on the owner anyway. Absolutely. And, and that's got nothing to do with actually how you build the building. It is the contractual uh, slog that actually pits people against each other. It doesn't do a it doesn't do a great job of aligning contractual interests. Uh, and and, so I've always said that the owner always holds all the risk. You can try to right. contract contract it away all you want, but at the end of the day, the owner owns all the risk. Yeah, and and, and I I think that's true worldwide. It's funny in, in Canada, they're very um, very happy with their kind. They're they're very focused on their contracts, um, and they. They read them and they and they try to do the work. And I remember a real estate developer client of mine in the state saying, "Signing the contract is only the beginning of the negotiation." Yeah. So the culture here is different. It really, is a contractual culture, and trying to get people to think about that more collaborative way of building things is um, um, is an interesting task because yeah. this is inherently a collaborative country. Yeah. Um, where there's there's more kind of sharing and collaboration, I think, in Canada than uh, almost. You know, in, certainly in the broad majority of countries in the world. So this is like a perfect place for it from my perspective. Um, so okay, let, me, so, let me rewind to my, to my education over my career. Um, yeah, yeah. About that time, Chevron discovered or thought that, that it was needed a stage gate approach to, to capital projects because it was a little bit of the Wild West before then. Right. And so they invented this thing called the Chevron Development Project and Execution Process. And I looked at it, I said, man, it's just ridiculous. That's stupid. Why does anybody need this? And they said, oh, OK, well, you're going to deploy it in Chevron. Oh, by said, the way, I don't want to do that. <laughs> I, 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 I don't want to do that. And they said, we didn't ask you if you wanted to do it. It was the only time in my career I got told what I was going to do if I wanted to continue working for the company. And I said, well, okay, I guess so. I, guess I need a job. So I yeah. said, okay, I'll put my shoulder into it and do it. And um, and we we did. We roll it out across the, the company. And it did help move us from chaos to, to a more deliberate approach. And that step was good. Um, I can now see in hindsight, it wasn't even close to enough. But anyway, that was my first taste of dealing with a project management system and then I was then I got to uh, to have a regional responsibility for projects so I was given all the projects in the Eurasia region uh, wow. along with our Sassol Chevron joint venture for gas to liquids a big project in Nigeria and we were going to build more elsewhere so got to spend a lot of time uh, working in places like Kazakhstan and Russia um, wow. Nigeria uh, to help uh, develop and execute projects there then towards towards the latter end of my career, um, 
Chevron has a really a, a massive uh, capital investment program. Uh, we were spending upwards of $30 billion a year. That's just our share, all these projects we have partners on. So that was, that equated to about $200 billion a year of projects under our management. And that was going on for multiple years. Uh, and we found ourselves needing to hire more people to gear up to do that, to handle that uh, level of work. And we didn't really have a good project management system to do that with. If you wanted to know how Chevron did construction management, you'd go talk to our top construction management guys and say, well, how do you do it? And then kind of replicate that. So I got brought into the center of, of the company in a in part called uh, Project Resources uh, Company at the time. It served all the streams of the company and said, hey, okay, your task is to develop a Chevron project management system, build it out. And so I did. Uh, and we looked for the best of the best. We went and we brought in, uh, for every discipline, we brought in our what we thought our top people in each of those disciplines, whether it was construction management or safety or uh, engineering management, whatever it was. Uh, and we had them capture what they did. Um, we wrote it down and then we'd compare ourselves in the industry and we'd say, is this the best of the best? Uh, and if it wasn't, we borrowed the best of the best from somebody else. We adopted some Shell and Exxon practices here and there. Uh, we looked at the Construction Industry Institute and uh, pulled heavily on especially things like advanced work packaging and um, um, AACE, uh, critical path scheduling, the whole cost engineering uh, uh, discipline. We brought that into the company. And at the end, and it took us about four years to put all this together. We built an wow. internal university on training people. We trained thousands of people in, in these products. So we had every, every discipline documented. We had uh, a manual on how to do everything. We had tools and guides, a whole hierarchy of uh, intellectual property. And I compared, it was second to none. Uh, in fact, we benchmarked ourselves religiously through a company called Independent Project Analysis, who served the energy industry and they looked at our system and said you you've got the best out there uh so i you know i was pretty proud of what we were <laughs> using the best of the best okay absolutely and then uh then i got the opportunity to say okay let's see if it works i said oh yeah i'd love to continue on in this role and see if it works that was a little unusual to stay in one role for so long in the company and so we started you know using it deploying it seeing it in use in projects and you know we uh, we did some benchmarking and we weren't we were making a little improvement but it wasn't very much and i thought oh man it's obvious the knuckleheads just aren't using the system you know we gotta <laughs> we gotta double down on education and enforcement right. so we did in fact we added uh, protocols for uh what we called assurance which was basically checking to see if key things had been completed. So we'd send teams into projects at particular points in time, and they would look and see what the project team would done, and they'd grade them on it. Uh, and so we, we, you know, we doubled down on enforcement, gave it a little more time, and again, our 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 results improved, but they were still really dismal. Right. Uh, only only twenty three percent of our projects were meeting the cost, the schedule, and the production forecast. At, at completion. Wow. You know, that's not a way in a commodity business, you don't stay in business doing that. <laughs> um, no, it, it, it sounds more, uh, it sounds almost governmental, you know, you run into a problem and what do you throw at it? You throw oversight at it. Yeah. You know, we're, we're just not watching people enough. It's not like, um, it's not like we trust our people. They must not be doing it right. And yet we continue to get the same results from the same system and you go, yeah. Hmm, yeah, maybe we're not, maybe this isn't. <laughs> Maybe we're not seeing some of the unintended consequences. Yeah, and every you know, lots of people had their solution. I mean, our, our legal department thought we just didn't have our contractors didn't have enough skin in the game, so we got to double down on uh, liquidated damages. Oh my gosh, that was I, that was a disaster, a wow. disaster. I mean, I loved liquidated damages as a lawyer because I knew oh, that yeah. it took it took a long time to find a judge that would ever listen to liquidated damages. Yeah, because, you know, all judges think there are penalties because they are yeah. almost all damages are pretty easy to figure out when you get someplace and liquidated damages are just just a hammer yeah. that doesn't drive good behavior. It actually drives bad behavior. So now if 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 they're in the payout zone, right. it's wonderful. Oh, they're great. But boy, you get in the penalty zone. 
and really, really, really bad things happen. Um, yeah. and, I mean, and we've, we've seen projects, major infrastructure projects, uh, not, you know, in North America, where when they get into the penalty zone, safety goes to hell. And accidents start happening and really bad stuff happens. So. I had one one very large project. The contractor got in the penalty zone, and they said, "We quit. We <laughs> gotta go. We're done. We're <laughs> out of here." <laughs> I mean, this is in the middle of nowhere, and it's like, okay, we got at our checkbook, and we we found a way to keep them going. We didn't want to own them as a company because we didn't want our own engineering company, but we could have. Yeah. Um, it, was, it was just a disaster. So that was clearly not the answer. So I, that sent me on a quest. I said, I, "Okay, we got to figure this out." I brought in uh, some creative people into the organization. I said, go, you're, you're my scouts, go find me stuff because I don't know the answer. The answers are clearly not in our industry because we had the best of the best in our industry. We had pulled in the best practices, CII, ACE, IPA, what we saw, you know, we're, we're partners in all kinds of projects around the world. So we saw what Shell did. We saw what Exxon did. We saw what uh, you name it, did. We had experience with them. We saw their processes and tools, and we just, we had the best of the best. And so we started looking outside of our industry and uh, got some exposure to companies like Ford, to IBM, uh, to Apple. Well, that was a fascinating uh, conversation with Apple on how they do product development. Just totally different. It kind of blew our minds. Um, and um, of course, I had a long line, long line of consultants at my door saying, oh, we've got your magic bullet. Just use our stuff. And, and, oh, yeah. And so I, I deci we decided to just run some experiments because we just really didn't know. We knew what we were doing was not successful. We knew we couldn't keep doing what we were doing because that's, you know, the definition of insanity. So we took some things for a test drive and we had about four or five different uh, little pilots that we ran around the world. Uh, and said, okay, let's see if it makes a difference. Let's watch it. Yeah. Um, and only one of those pilots actually, hmm, that actually worked. That actually improved our situation. And that was a, a project we had in China called Chang'an Bay. And we are, it's a big onshore gas field. We we're having a terrible time completing that project. It was just, it was just a slog. It was just, it was just awful. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, we brought in something called Project Production Control through uh, Strategic Project Solution, Todd's company. Uh, and none of us had a clue what it was. You know, they they talked talk, talk to us about it, but you know, the words were all bouncing off our brains. We just, it was just this whole language. It was totally foreign to us. Um, so, well, let's try it. And the project team responded very positively. Their feedback was, hey, this really was a key factor in helping us complete the project. We, we were wondering if we'd ever get it done. Uh, and we went from, I don't know if we'll ever get it done to, hey, we got this done. And it, we got it done safely and we got it started up and, and we were making money. And we thought, wow, that, that is really interesting. I don't understand it. But it had a really effective um, impact on bringing uh, people together on what would be done literally on a daily basis. Because we were, we were at the point where we, you know, the contract would give us a plan and you'd go look at what they were doing. And it was every day was way different than what they told us they were going to do. If even if even if anybody even showed up. <laughs> so uh, this allowed us to get into a rhythm uh, at the job site of having a plan for one day and actually getting the work done and the next day and getting the work done. I mean, it sounds really kind of silly, but it worked <laughs> yeah. and we weren't getting it done before then. So about that, we said, Oh, wow, that's, that's really interesting. Uh, let's continue to work on this. Said I dropped all the other experiments because they were all a failure. Right. And I said, uh, let's try this on Gorgon, which was our big uh, LNG project at the time in the Northwest shelf in Australia. And we were just in the completion phase of that project um, and having a very difficult time completing it. Mm -hmm. Sounds familiar. We right. had, religiously used advanced work packaging, uh, insulation work packs and all that jazz. And it was just dying under its own weight. Uh, we probably had more people. And in some cases we had, it took more time to create the work package than it did to actually do the work. It was just, uh, it was just a mess. And we just stopped it. We said, well, we're better off just not doing this and let the contractor just, just roll. But, right. I, you know, we were bumping along and that wasn't working very well either. So we brought in that production control at the end of that project. 
Uh, train one, which we didn't have it uh, in effect then, set a world-class record on tour performance in terms of time it took to complete it. We got it, we got it up and running for train two and hey, we hit industry average. And then train three, we set a world-class performance on, on how quickly we could complete it. And what I watched is, I still don't understand it, by the way. <laughs> but I, I watched it bring the, the different contractors. That, so we had a different contractor for each discipline. Mechanical was different than electrical. Sure. You know, the usual. Yep. It brought those subs All together in, in a way of working together that I had never seen work before. So a mechanical con, uh, uh, general superintendent uh, told us, uh, yeah, I used to know my counterpart in the electrical. And yeah, we talked once in a while. Usually we just tried to beat each other to the work face to get the space so that we could do our part. And, right. you know, all kinds of conflicts. But now we're sitting together on a daily basis and helping solve each other's problems. When I heard that, I said, okay, this is it. This is really important. If you can get two competing subs to help solve each other's problems, to get the work done in a logical and orderly way, there is something magical about this. So we got to, that began my personal education and indoctrination into production management. I became a, uh, a pupil of Todd and James and uh, man, it was a pretty, it was a pretty rough uh, coaching, but eventually I got my mind opened. Um, and we began, uh, we did something very different for Chevron. We said, look, this is, we don't understand this all, but we get the idea that there's a production system that's always created for a project. Forget this other stuff that we're doing, uh, you know, project management stuff, which is largely kind of, you know, setting up contracts, administering contracts, doing project controls, doing scheduling, rescheduling, rescheduling, and rescheduling, and then rescheduling again, doing all that, which is the, what the system required, uh, instead being very focused on how the work was going to go. We get it that that's super important and totally ignored, or we're just totally oblivious to that production system being deliberate about it and controlling that production system. We get that. We don't understand how to do it, uh, but we're gonna learn by doing. So we, uh, we decided and it was very different for Chevron. Usually we had study something for a couple of years and then roll out big flash, you know, be, some big initiative and, and have all the glossy brochures and everything. We said, we don't have, we can't afford to do that. So we, we, we grabbed uh, an enterprise agreement with SPS and I, deferred my retirement for a couple of years and just began leading a team to deploy that across the company. We, we literally took our projects, the biggest to the littlest. We said, we're gonna tackle biggest to littlest and order priority and go to that project and deploy whatever we can at that stage of that project. And that, so this, was, uh, that was really, really interesting. And we learned is, by doing it. This is all very new to <clears throat> to listeners, I'm sure, because they, they have been in that project management space or they've been in the trade space or they've been, you know, um, pointy elbows, uh, fighting for territory uh, on yeah. the ceiling for their anchors and chasing each other. And now, and now we, we really are moving towards a more collaborative culture. I mean, owners are not only looking at IPD, but they're looking at alliancing, they're looking at progressive design build, progressive P3s. All of these have the element of getting contractor builders on the team early in in design, but it still doesn't focus on the production system, which you are developing in design. I mean, you are designing the way that you're going to build this building in the time and for the money that you have in design. I mean, it doesn't start like, okay, here are the plans, let's go. And you guys had to pick up the plans and, and kind of move through that. But Explain for us, if you will, kind of walk through a, a typical week on uh, one of these jobs where you really had a production plan in place and how, you know, people, uh, I talked to a superintendent last week, he said, oh, the trades are doing fine. They're not going to listen to us. They don't want to talk to each other, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, and I know that uh, I've seen the system to some degree with, with Todd's help that they go in and they reanalyze every bit of work that was done during the day and they spit out a, a new program at night for the next day. I mean, it's really, it's very hands-on, but what is that? What's the people, what, what are the politics of it? How does it work? You start on Monday, you have this production plan, you've got that. I mean, you've got mechanical guys and, and plumbers and electrical folks on your projects, probably steam fitters, you know, 
pipers, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, they're all disparate and they all have their own disciplines and they all have, uh, back in the day, they all had contracts that they owned that, that weren't related to other, other contracts. They were just related to getting their stuff done. So how did it look like on your project in uh, Australia where you set the world record, <laughs> the, the land speed record, uh, kind of on a weekly basis so that people can go, oh, I see how that works. Yeah, so you're talking about the control element of production management, which is we, we got to talk about the big picture at some point here. Okay, well, so that, that, we can start about that and we can talk about the big picture and then come back to this. If that's yeah, maybe it maybe would be better to answer that question in context of. Let's of do that. So, I'm, a context, I'm a big context guy. All right. So <laughs> uh, so if, if one wants to be uh, deliberate about the production system that's generated, because it's one generated for every project whether you like it or not, or a, 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 a grouping of production systems. And then um, even if you, it, even whether you know it or not. Yeah, it's there. There is a system that's operating yeah, there. Yeah, to me, to, to me as a project guy with Chevron, it was invisible to me. I just didn't even, yeah. I didn't even recognize it, which makes me feel kind of stupid today <clears throat> because it was alive and well. And had I had the right eyes on, I would have seen what was going on. I would have seen the production system. Um, so it, it, the, the, so we start at 10,000 feet. It's, it's, really, it's really pretty simple. If you want to shift away from traditional project management practices, expose, see, be deliberate about the production system. Uh, it's, it's really, it's kind of simple. It's what we call four, five, three. There's four verbs, five levers, and three curves. Four verbs are, you got to be very focused on the design and what is being designed and how it's designed. Uh, the make that says anything that's fabricated or created for that project, uh, how things are transported, and then how things are actually assembled or constructed. So very strong focus on those four things, because that happens on every project, whether it's an energy project or a building project or you, a submarine, you know, it's all the same stuff. And then there's five levers. And this was, this was like, man, the scales came off my eye to, to, to learn that there was science that governed how these production systems work. And I didn't even know it existed because I'd been brought up with the iron triangle, you know, that there's those three, you know, the cost, cost quality. quality, those are hopelessly inter And if you want more one, you got to give up the other. That's why I was trained. I mean, I learned that in my first year uh, as a construction engineer. <clears throat> and I learned that, you know, that's not true. And it's not science-based. So there's actually science called operation science that is used in the industrial sector. I mean, that's how they get such a significant productivity out of, you know, car factories and chip factories and those kinds of things by using that science. And I learned there were five levers that as a project person, you have five levers that you can pull that are going to uh, dictate how that system will perform. One is the product design. So the way you design whatever it is you're going to build, um, what you design, um, you know, whether you're going to have bolted connections or welded connections or just all those thousands and thousands of decisions that are made uh, influence what it takes to actually build it. And then the process design, and that's the workflows that it takes to actually do the work. Uh, capacity, which is uh, equipment, people, uh, barges, you know, transportation roads, all those kind of things that it takes to actually do the work. And then inventory, and that's all the work in process, totally invisible to me, sort of. <laughs> and and when, I, when I talked about that Chevron system, well, let me, let me continue on and I'll sneak back to that. So, okay. um, and then last is variability, because we assume variability is just a given, so yeah, I'll just deal with it. No, uh, we didn't realize when we were designing in variability no. uh, and creating ourselves a greater risk for more variability uh, versus reducing variability, reacting to it, responding to it, managing it, um, and uh, rapidly replanning the project. And then three curves, and those are the scientific relationships between cycle time, utilization, uh, throughput and work in process, and I, we, you know, we're, we don't need to cover all those curves, but there are mathematical relationships that exist. And if um, uh, and a key one for me uh, was the relationship between work in process and cycle time. 
and I'll come back to the Chevron system that I designed. When I look back and analyze the Chevron system that I designed through the lens of production management, through the four verbs, five levers, and three curves, I see that I designed a system to fail. It was actually designed to generate work in process. Lots of it. Because we had, it was all a push system. It was uh, all the work has to get done. So get it all going as fast as you can. Things pile up, very intense focus on craft productivity. So if the worker didn't have something to do that was on plan, shift them to start something else that was off plan. Ooh. Oh yeah. <laughs> and so when you when we look in hindsight at our projects, we saw very high levels of work and process way exceeding what was needed to be optimal. Yeah, there's a level that's needed to be optimal. There's no doubt about that. But very large batches going through the system. Um, very large piles of work and process so the downstream operation could be protected from anything coming upstream. As a construction manager, for example, I wanted all my materials sitting in the warehouse. So I could pick and choose and do whatever I wanted to. I never wanted to be waiting on a piece of material. But I understand the negative impact of that. And the mathematic, the, the science says, if you build all that whip up, you're gonna take longer. And I had a real hard time getting my head around that. But once I did, I could see it. And I was like, oh my gosh, how, oh, how huge of a mistake it was to build a project management system managing $200 billion a year that was designed to fail. And it was no wonder we couldn't complete a project on schedule and on our estimated cost. It was just no wonder. So let me just let me just tweak one of the things that you said. You talk about work in progress, and is that is that both um, fabricating ductwork and doing RFIs and checking on stuff and all that kind of administrative stuff, or is it just the fabrication of the of of the pieces and parts that are going to go into the into the building that yeah, it, it was, part of the work yeah, it was work waiting on work now in in knowledge work so in the engineering phase it is you know intellectual work waiting on intellectual work but it's it's very focused on the physical work uh okay. and piles of physical work uh, yeah, for, yeah. for example we, we built a, a very large uh plant in kazakhstan with thousands of piles in the ground and we chose um, a method of uh, we bought all the piles well in advance. We had them all sitting there, thousands of them sitting there, all coated because they were cement piles with special coating. And then we drove all the piles in sequence. And then we came back later and put pile caps on all the piles in sequence. And then later we came back and put foundations and all that. And had we had a, a more of a flow, we would have had piles coming in, being picked up, driven, and then right behind that pile cropping and pile caps going on and right behind that foundations going on. So we right. probably extended that project by two years with that approach that we used. Yeah. So I, uh, I, I, and, I tying, like to, yeah, and tying I, up cash that could have been used elsewhere in the company to fund another project. Yeah. I, I, I like to call that the space between work. Yeah. You've got work going and there's lots of space for work behind it that isn't utilized because you haven't thought about it. You, you think that everything is start, stop, start, stop, and it's really start, stagger, start, stagger, and you don't have to worry about getting it finished because almost everybody finishes things <laughs> that they start. Yeah, no, that's that's true. So, um, so so that's the the big picture of you know four verbs, five levers, three curves. Focused on that. Focused on uh, techniques and methods to, to harness those in the life of a project and pulling on those five levers. Um, and and so, as I see now, we could have been and should have been deliberate in actually designing the production system that we needed to be able to accomplish the business result, which was reflected in the schedule. I mean, the schedule was used to say, this is when we want to have this done. Right. So the schedule is, is what is the desired state, what you want to have done, what you need, what you're basing your, your business uh, plans on. But it's only uh, it's only um, what might happen. It's not what will happen. So if you look then on the right hand side to the production system, that's what will happen. And I 
and, and one needs to be very deliberate about designing that production system, using those five levers to be able to accomplish the business result. Yeah. And then once you design that production system, then there are things you can put in place to understand that, okay, is that production system working? So think of the production system as a digital twin for the production system. Okay. We right. got our digital twin. It's telling us what we, how we want this system to work. And then we have something called production control, which uh, feeds on a, on a very short-term basis back up into the production system. So you have this loop of feedback and understanding, are you on track with that? Do you need to make changes in the policies for that production system, et cetera, uh, to be able to you know, keep that project on track? And any, you go, to, go, to, uh, go talk to Ford, and that's exactly what they do. They don't use CPM to, to schedule their work. You know, it's ridiculous to think about using CPM in a, in a factory model, right? Right. They have a production system that they've designed. It's got robots. It has uh, stations. It has the methods that they're using to do it all. They have their tack time. So the F-150 plant's producing one truck every minute, and that's all they are focused on. We're producing one quality truck every minute. We need to take that same mindset into the project world. And so this production control is really the eyes and ears and keeping ourselves on track and rapidly replanning. So let me fast forward to your other question on a, on a weekly basis. What does this production control look like? Well, it starts by having the, the, the people that are doing the work, the multiple crafts together create something called a production schedule. So this is the dance that happens between the disciplines to complete a piece of work. So just pick a, you know, you got to pick the right pieces of work. And that's usually uh, pretty, pretty obvious what the next things are that need to be done or, or you pull them out of the schedule and say, this is what needs to be accomplished. They're like the, the mini milestones, right? Get the people, get all the disciplines together that are responsible for creating that. And that could include um, uh, QAQC, radiography could include uh, uh, inspectors, building inspectors, everybody right. it takes to complete that piece of work. You create a sequence of work. Uh, and then from that, everybody got their marching orders for the day that were as a part of the plan. And one of the one of the beautiful things about that is if the predecessor work was not complete, the system would not allow the next thing to start. OK, so it was absolutely dependent on completing the work that was needed, press, the precedent work to be completed. Then you then you got your instructions to do the work the next, you know, the next point in time. Right. Um, and this is being updated on a daily basis. So now everybody's, so we have a production schedule. This is overall the sequence of work. Who's going to do not, it's not a schedule uh, per se. It's a sequence of work. The order things will, will happen in with the different disciplines. And then from that, everybody gets a production plan, a daily production plan by craft. And some people got it on their phone. Some people got it in paper. Some people got it in their daily meeting and said, here's what you need to do today to accomplish that production schedule. And then on a daily basis, that was updated. So I got, I got to attend a lot of those uh, update meetings. I just watch be a fly on the wall in the back of the room. And I watch people um, explain what they got done that day. And if the pl planned work didn't get done, they talked about why it couldn't get done. What happened? We categorized, uh, we captured those reasons, we categorized those things, and that did two things. One is it got them focused on solving the problems that were preventing the planned work from being done, right. but it also provided a rich uh, uh, source of data. So you could look one level above that and say, okay, overall, do we have any systemic issues that are preventing the planned work from being done? And we did, and, and it was very helpful. We were able to deal more effectively on solving the right problems. So we saw, Dick, we saw our one day plan. Okay, so we measured, we, when we started this, we measured what percent of the work that's planned just one day in advance, this is craft work, this is in, at Gorgon, how much of that work is being completed one day, at, planned one day in advance? And we found ourselves about man, 40, 45%. Let's stop and think mm -hmm. about that. We're, <laughs> we're, just under the international average of 54 yeah we're almost <laughs> done with this project and we can only we can't even plan reliably one day in advance right uh, you no wonder the schedule's not predictable <laughs> so, so um, this is really um i mean how i would talk about this in, in our little world is that this is really the the last planner on steroids 
because you are doing, you're planning your activity and whether you do it in stickies or a production plan or whatever, and then you measure how much of that stuff gets done so that you are able to look at the, the reliability of it. But you're also looking at um, how it, the work gets replanned. You're looking at variance because you want to control it systemically. You're looking at um, commitments, but the, the part of this plan that sounds really on steroids to me is the make work ready part of what the last planner system would do. Yeah, but you yeah. really focused on looking at work in progress, and that is what enables utilization. It allows you to pull the levers because if there's no work to be done, you can pull the utilization lever all you want, and nothing happens. Nothing happens. Yeah, and, and it, you know, last planner was like the um, the uh, grandfather. <laughs> yeah. Of production control, and, and unfortunately, it hasn't matured since it was kind of generated then. And a production control, really uh, a key differentiator is it manages work in process. It yep. stops you from generating work in process, which we all know, based on the science, is going to extend schedule if you build it beyond uh, a certain level. That's a real fundamental difference between production control and, and last planner. Okay. Um, but yeah, it's, but that's why I say it's on, on steroids in the sense that you are yeah. now really focused on more than just reliability of crews and releasing crews and more than just flow because flow gets into not only reliability but it gets into production as well you really are focused on production oh yeah right? and using and using five levers and yeah. i think that's another that's another differentiation is a, an intense focus on use of the five levers to solve the problems uh to get the you know to get the right work done in the right sequence uh, as orderly as you can and um, and that's i think that's one of the misnomers about that the last planner is that people think it's kind of self-effectuating that there aren't controls that need to oh, be pushed, but that's that's not true, right? You, yeah, this good, control is is really important, and and oh my gosh, Dick, I found to be able to actually understand what work was done on a daily basis because the, the metrics were there. We could roll all the way up. We could see where we were, yeah, any, anywhere we were applying production control as a as a leader sitting in my office in Houston. I could log in and see what work was, is done on a daily basis. Th that level of insight was, was uh, phenomenal. That's all I could right. say. Because traditional project controls, our data, we're looking in the rear view mirror uh, yeah. using earned progress, which is, you know, percent complete, percent of this, percent of that. Um, and always uh, months behind schedule. I mean, we're always looking month by behind yeah. schedule. One, one, one guy said, you know, this is like driving an Abrams tank full speed, looking out the rear view mirror. And that's exactly yeah. what project controls was. Just project controls are nearly, my, my point of view, okay, just my opinion, nearly useless to a project manager. Maybe on a very gross basis, but they right. do not effectively help you deal with variability, things going different, rapidly replanning, right. keeping the project on track and managing work and process. It does nothing to help you with that. Well, and, and it really is, it, it, it focuses in on the wrong things, right? Because, oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, you, there, there's a schedule and at the end of 30 days, somebody updates the schedule. Well, we we all know how that works. I mean, they, they start putting in 724s to try to make the schedule look like you're actually gonna meet it. Something happened on June 6th and at the end of the month, they don't know how to report it. The owner sees it in the middle of July, understands what the problem is by the end of July, asks for a recovery schedule. And by September, you're dealing with something that happened on June 6th. Yeah, that's when you're right. moving stickies or you're, or you're replanning every single day, you're dealing with it right then because it has an effect on your, you're making a very small, you're making a very large boulder, a small pebble. So that the ripple effect yeah. is organized every that, single day. That, that, that's absolutely right. That, that's well put. Now, while it's really effective for the craft work, what I found even more effective was when we took it into the design phase. Mm. And, and Dick, we, we would get the engineers together. And, and again, the, no, I'll keep key point I want to make. There wasn't a planning person in the room. Right in the field. This is, these are the people, the general foreman, the foreman, the superintendents that are actually doing the work. We didn't need any planners in the room. We needed right. the people that were doing the work on how they were going to do it because they, they knew how to do the work, okay? 
Exactly. So we did the same. We did the same thing in engineering. We brought the engineers together, brought the leads together, and we had to complete whatever it was. Okay, a loop diagram, or you just name it, whatever it was. Right. And we would ask them to map out their work processes to accomplish delivering that engineering deliverable. And we we always heard, okay, we're dealing with all the top major engineering firms in the world. We'd always heard, oh, we got that. Okay, well, it's all documented. It's in our manuals. We got that. Everybody knows what it is. Okay, this, this will be really fast then. All we want right. to do is put it on the board. And just so we all understand it, and we understand as an owner how we inter interface with that, because there's approval steps in the engineering process and all that. Okay, so we would, we, here's the typical story. Yeah, we have a five-step process for that. You know, a, a few days later, with all the disciplines in the room, we found out, we uncovered there were actually 200 steps in the process. And not a soul in that room knew that. Not a right. soul. <laughs> and so I think the impact of production control in the, in the engineering side and the knowledge work is even more, if it could be even more critical, but it's hugely insightful. That was the first time ever in my career, Dick, that I actually understood what engineering was done and not done. Uh, you know, because it's, uh, it's, all, it's all done, you know, digitally. You can't right. see it anymore. You can't go out in the drafting board and look at the drawings and say, do they look complete or not? Right. You can't go look at the plastic. It's all digital. So how do you know when something's done? Um, and, you know, we do earn progress for engineering, which is a total joke. Right. Just a total joke. And it, it gives you no insight. for. So we saw ourselves running blind through the whole engineering phase of almost every project. So and, have you... Absolutely. And never, never meeting the schedule dates that we needed. Never. Right. So, so we could um, come out of the blocks on projects months or years behind before we even, you know, cut a piece of steel. Well, anytime that you begin to think of these things as linear processes, they always take five or six times longer than, uh, you know, Martin Fisher has this concept and he's one of your, uh, one of your guys. Yeah. Uh, integrated concurrent engineering, where you're doing, which is really set-based design and engineering, where you're working on multiple options, you know, all at the same time. And part of what I like to do in target value design is take a take an architecture firm, um, create these big ideas with the owner, with, you know, what's your value proposition? You know, we, we want this to be um, the iconic center of our campus at the yeah. University of Toronto. Yeah. And we put, and then we say, what are the big ideas that look like, you know, that make that? Well, bell tower or a facade or you know, all these big ideas before you start drawing. And then you get six teams from the uh, engineering and design firms and you put them at tables and they all design, design to those big ideas at one time mm -hmm. so that you're getting multiple concurrent ideas rather than a single line that ends up being what, what you build. Because once you release the engineers or the architects, in my experience, to design the building, they start drawing. More or less, that's the building that you get. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know, or more or less, that's the plant that more you get. More or less, yeah. Yep. <laughs> and usually less. <laughs> usually, usually less. That's yeah. right. Because then you discover all the trade-offs between the various yeah. disciplines. And, and uh, there's all kinds of trade-offs. You know, you can't. You so so how are you... I mean, this is all, so if you have a $200 billion capital program a year, which is a lot, obviously. I mean, some countries don't have $200 billion capital right. programs a year. Um, and you're designing these systems to help you get there. What do you say about, you know, I'll sit down with, uh, uh, you and I'll have lunch with Dean Reed. And, and he'll be working at DPR and he'll say, wow, this is so cool, Gary, but how do I, you know, I got my guys who do P6 scheduling and I got my, you know, estimators and they're all working in closets with no windows. <laughs> um, how do I get them to start thinking about production systems and production planning in design? What's it, what's it look like on a, on a construction project where you can see uh, certainly a, a piping plant looks a little more like a factory than uh, you know, at Humber College right now, we're doing a building that is 12 different buildings, basically. It's two theaters, it's practice rooms, 
it's a cultural hub, it's a gymnasium, it's a student yeah. residence, it's a, you know. How do we start thinking about production planning, A, in design, and then B, if we're in construction, which we are right now, where we're still finishing up design for the second phase, how do we start thinking about that uh, in real terms that can improve what we're what we're trying to do? Well, I personally, <laughs> I wouldn't. I wouldn't look to my project controls. I wouldn't look to my cost engineering function to do that. I would take ownership of that and say, we are going to design our production system to accomplish these lofty goals, and I would get the people responsible for doing the work wherever they are, um, as many of them together as I could to um, first off understand, you know, the basics of production systems, how they work and what, what the five levers are. And, the, you know, a little bit, of, you got to understand a little bit of the science. Yeah. Oh, no, absolutely. And then I would, uh, I would use production modeling to uh, design that production system so that I could accomplish these, these lofty goals. I, you know, you got to pick your battles and, um, I found that starting with with cost engineering is not usually a very productive place to start the battle. It's a very they have a lot of ownership of what they do, and um, you know this this isn't intended to displace P six. This isn't a war with P six. Um, really, it's a war with CPM. <laughs> I mean, it's, there's no argument that CPM has some real issues, and it's being used for a lot of things it was never even intended to be used for when it was developed. Right. Um, as as Todd would, and I were talking about yesterday, it's the screwdriver. You know, a screwdriver has one, is designed for a purpose. But right. think about what we do as screwdrivers. I do it all the time. I use it oh, to yeah, stir, stir paint cans. I use it to poke things. I use it to scrape things. I use it to pry things. That's not what it's designed for. But right. I use it, you know, it does so so with those other things. But I do it out of convenience. And I think uh, CPM is a little bit like that. That it, it started off with a, as a model to try to be predictive on how long something was going to take. Okay. But it, I don't think it was even ever expected to be the path of construction. Right. And it's, that's what it's become in a lot of people's mind. They, they think that's what's actually going to happen. And it's not. Yeah. Out of the thousands of projects we managed, I don't think we had a single project that actually played out like the, like the initial schedule. They right. just don't. No. Uh, and and so I, I wouldn't I wouldn't start with cost engineering. I'd start with the people responsible for doing the work, and okay. I would uh, talk to them about a different way. And I, I'll, I'll use my own illustration of building a retirement home right now. Next next Tuesday, I'm going to sit down with a general contractor and, and some of his key folks, and we're going to create a production schedule for for my house because I want to, everybody to be aligned on the sequence of things that need to happen all the different subs that need to come in, when they come in, how they how that dance is going to play out. So that we're all aligned on the same page and we can use that in communication with the subcontractors. Um, I, I'm finding the building um, industry as well. It's it's even more of a challenge than the energy sector. Oh, absolutely. So, it's so um uh, it's so specialized you know you got one guy that does this and one guy that does this and one guy does this, and and, yeah. and and the number of different companies you've got to get involved to just build something very you know a home yeah relatively simple is amazing to me um yeah. and keeping yeah. that dance all aligned is is really terribly difficult and so that's where that's where i would start okay yeah it's, it's funny because I, I i redid my house in la jolla um, I had bought this 1,200 square foot beach house because I got on the roof and I saw white water and I went, okay, we need a little help here, yeah. but, but it's going to need something. And having spent, you know, 20 years at that point in my career as a construction lawyer, I got the trades in that I needed on weekends for cash. So when I redid the electrical system, I had the electrical guy come at six o'clock in the morning on Saturday. They yeah. left at six o'clock at night on Sunday. There was nobody in front of him. He had nobody. He had to bang on all the predecessor activities that had been done, and he was there and gone. Yeah. And just because I knew that, you know, when you're building your house, there's going to be four or five trades that will triple book uh, yes. their work because they are routinely disappointed that they can't go work someplace. So they'll have they will have committed three places to be. 
And so oh, even when you align them, it's hard to get them to show up. <laughs> well, absolutely. And, and what you're pointing out, and this applies to, you know, building your own house or any, any kind of our, our work that we do. Uh, every one of these contractors has their own production system. Right. And you're just, you're just a blip in their production system. You're just a, an off ramp in their production system to serve you, but they're optimizing their own production system. They're dealing with the variability in their production system. That's why they triple book because they've got variability stuff happens and they want to keep their crews busy, et cetera, et cetera. And when one, when one recognizes that you're a, as a project, you're a temporary thing, right. but these companies you're using are not a temporary thing. They're a, they're an ongoing operation and you're intersecting with those ongoing operations when you when you stop and really think about the implications of that, it it, it makes you realize how um, how important it is to be very deliberate about your production system. You you had a strategy for your production system the way you just managed that, and you right. managed the issues of intersecting with their production systems the way you handled those subs, and you know you you were managing your production system without even knowing it probably. Yeah. Oh no! I had a pretty good. I had a pretty good idea that yeah. that I was managing a production system because I, but I, I had designed it to to mitigate the flaws that I saw in the system. It wasn't optimal, obviously, because it took me 13 months to get the house done, and I was living in a place, you know, with a trench in my bedroom for a, a month <laughs> and a half. But um, uh, well, this is this has been great. This was everything that I hoped it would be. Any any last uh, lessons for folks? things that they should think about. I mean, I think you've been really, uh, well, you've been I, yeah, really I, lucid, like I said. I would, I would encourage your listeners to not, uh, not wait uh, to try. Um, uh, the best way to understand this, the best way to get your head around it is just go try it. Uh, and that's what I did by learning, by doing, uh, when we grabbed it for Chevron, I didn't understand it. I these ideas, this, the terminology I just used, I didn't have, what do you, what are you talking about? Sounds like a lot of a consultant speak to me. And, but when we actually took it for a test drive, we took these different things. We took modeling for a test drive. We took production system optimization for a test drive. We took production control for a test drive and got our feet wet and got our hands dirty. And we say, wow, now we're starting to see it. We're starting to understand it. Uh, and I, I see too many people saying, well, it's not the right time. This is not the right project. And I'm saying, you know, there's never a right time. There's never a right project. Just grab something and try it. Get started. Get yourself educated. Um, I mean, we, we have opportunities available through the Production Institute. A small advertisement here for if people want a basic education in this, we have a, a program through Cal Poly for the building sector, and we're just standing up one in Texas A&M right now for the industrial sector. And we're going to we're going to have these uh, around the world. We're going to have them around the globe. We're, we're working on one in the Middle East right now. So there's a way to get a basic education in what these things are. But then the most important part is just get your feet, get your feet dirty, learn by doing, get, give it a try. Right. Um, so uh, on the. On the plug, I, I want to give a plug because I want I want the PPI to be a you know a real a very successful think tank around specifically the production aspects of, of what we're doing. So what's the what's the website? How do people get a hold of of you and the and and the institute and the find out about those programs that are, you're um, up and running? So we've got an active website, Project Production uh, Production Institute. Very simple. Um, here's a slide that uh, has all their contact information on it. And you can see the website address and, and my contact info. If you got questions, you know, just drop me a note. We'd be glad to work with you. All right. Well, thank you so much for taking the time today. Uh, we're getting up at uh, O-Dark 30 and um, <laughs> energizing the, the space. It seems like we just started about seven minutes ago and uh, we're already- Time went, went, went by quickly, so that- Yeah, that was great. Well, you've got a great story and I'm really happy to share it with uh, with the podcast listeners. So um, let's stay in touch. 
And thanks for your time and thanks to uh, all the work, that all the great work that you guys are doing out there. I really appreciate it. Thank you for tuning in to the Lean Construction Blogs podcast. If you've enjoyed this episode, please help us spread the word by sharing, subscribing, or leaving a review on your preferred podcast listening platform. Remember to join us next time as we continue to lower the barriers to applying lean construction and help take your lean journey to the next level. And don't forget to visit the Lean Construction blog to stay up to date on our latest podcast episodes, weekly blog posts, monthly webinars, and upcoming conferences. We hope to see you on the next episode.